हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द क्विक मेडिकल रिवीजन सीरीज ऑफ माय यूट्यूब चैनल मेडिकल स्टडी इन दिस लेक्चर आई विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द वेरियस क्वेश्चंस आस्क इन द ऑल इंडिया आयुष पीजी एंट्रेंस एग्जाम व्हिच वाज हेल्ड इन अगस्त 2017 आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू डिस्कस ऑल द क्वेश्चंस राइट नाउ जस्ट हैव सिलेक्टेड फ्यू एनाटॉमी क्वेश्चंस फ्रॉम द एग्जाम एंड along with the explanation we are going to discuss and find out the answer remember one thing whenever you are giving any mcq exam if you know the answer just by studying the question you are 100% correct but if you find out the answer from the options you may not be 100% correct so try to find out the answer just by reading the question if you know it you are absolutely right so let us start with the exam now question 1 all of the following provide attachment of trapezius muscle except first trip occiput clavicle and scapula now if without going through the options you know what are the attachments of the trapezius you can easily come out with the answer so before seeing the answer let us see what are the attachments of the trapezius now here we have the muscles of the back the muscles of the back are trapezius latissimus dorsi levator scapulae rhomboidus minor and rhomboidus major now the question is about the trapezius so let us start with the trapezius attachments we have the origin from the external occipital protuberance we have the origin from the medial side of the extra medial side of the superior nuchal line and from the ligamentum nuchae and from c7 to t12 spine these are the four origins of the trapezius the trapezius muscles inserts into the upper fibers and inserts into the clavicle that is the lateral part of the clavicle or lateral one third of the clavicle the middle fibers into the acromion process and the upper lip of the crest of the spine of scapula and the lower fibers in the deltoid tubercle on the medial side of the spine of the scapula so these are the attachments now from the attachment we know now we have the external occipital protuberance nuchal line ligamentum nuchae and c7 to t12 spine and the attachment with the clavicle in the form of insertion acromion process in upper lip of crest of spine and deltoid tubercle before moving to the answer let us revise more about the muscles of the back then we have the latissimus dorsi another major muscle of the back levator scapulae a smaller muscle rhomboidus minor and the rhomboidus major are the smaller muscles the action of the trapezius the action of the trapezius is shrugging of the shoulder that is the elevation of the scapula retraction of the scapula it steadies the scapula and helps in abduction of the arm beyond 90 degree these are the four actions of the trapezius muscle beside that we have another muscle that is latissimus dorsi let us uh, see the attachments of the latissimus dorsi also as you can very well see the latissimus dorsi is here so latissimus dorsi originate from the iliac crest that is the posterior one third of the outer lip of iliac crest then arise from the lumbar fascia then from the spine c7 to sorry t10 t7 to t12 spine it gives an origin for it arises from t7 to t12 spine the lumbar fascia and from the iliac crest and also from the lower four lip ribs this is the origin and from the inferior of the scapula so we have the origin from the lumbar fascia we have the origin from this pelvic crest we have the origin from t7 to t12 origin from lower four ribs and from the inferior angle of scapula and this muscle inserts into the uh, and this muscle inserts into the floor of the intertubercular sulcus that is it also forms the boundary of the axilla and that is form the posterior fold of the axilla so this is the latissimus dorsi you can very well see here the latissimus dorsi the origin is from the pelvic crest from the lumbar fascia from t7 to t12 spines and then originate uh, inserting into the intertubercular sulcus this is the latissimus dorsi we have the smaller muscles the rhomboidus minor and rhomboidus major the rhomboidus minor arises from the ligamentum nuchae that is here the ligamentum nuchae and c7 to t1 spine 
and inserts here at the spine of the scapula that is the root of the spine of scapula rhomboidus major from T2 to T5 spines and then inserts on the lower part below the spine that is on the medial border of the scapula below the spine levator scapulae arising from the transfer process of C1, C2, C3 and C4 and you can very well see inserting on the part or medial part above the spine, above the root of the spine. So, superior angle and upper part of the medial border of the scapula. So, medial border of scapula at the root of the spine and at the medial border below the spine. So, these are the muscles of the back. So, remember the action of the trapezius is shrugging. The action of the levator scapulae is basically the elevation of the scapula. The action of the rhombidus major and minor are basically the retraction of the scapula and levator scapulae is, and then the latissimus dorsi. Latissimus dorsi, remember, is a muscle which helps in swimming. That means all the movements of the shoulder are carried by the latissimus dorsi. Okay, and it are latissimus dorsi is also a muscle which is known as climbing muscle or it is an essential muscle of climbing. Then in our option we had first rib also. So you can very well see the attachments of the first rib. The first rib is an anterior part and the posterior part of the first rib. We have some muscles that is the origin of subclavius muscle and serratus anterior. We have the scalenus medius and scalenus anterior insertion. We have the costoclavicular ligament and it is traversed by the subclavian artery and the vein and the neck is associated with sympathetic trunk, superior intercostal vein, artery, superior intercostal artery and T1 nerve. So vein, artery and nerve. So very well you can see there is no attachment of the trapezius with the first strip. So the answer of the question is now the attachments to the trapezia are provided by occiput clavicle where we have the insertion in the scapula we have the insertion occiput we have the origin but no attachment of the trapezius with the first strip so answer is the first strip now the second question is about the sternal angle so you must know everything about the sternal angle now what is the sternal angle what are the structures related to the sternal angle so sternal angle is a landmark for locating the level of jugular notch second intercostal cartilage siphoid process and the costal margins so let us see the sternal angle here we have the sternum we have the manubrium sterni and we have the ziphoid process and here is the sternal angle where manubrium is joining with the sternum so we have the sternal angle that is and jugular notch is here at the upper part of the manubrium so jugular notch is not at all related with the sternal angle now relation of sternal angle, sternal angle is also known as angle of Lewis. Remember the mnemonic red plant. It ha will help you in knowing the relations of the sternal angle. So red plant is a mnemonic for this. Now you can see R is related to the rib. That is the second costal cartilage. Remember this sternal angle is an important landmark clinically also for counting the ribs. Here the second rib or the second costal cartilage attached. So it marks an area from where we can count the ribs. So R is the rib, second costal cartilage and rib. A is the arch of aorta. Arch of aorta starts from here and ends here. That means the ascending aorta ends here and descending aorta starts here. And arch of aorta starts from here and ends at here. That is the arch of aorta. Then the trachea divides into right and left at this level T. P is pulmonary trunk is divides. Pulmonary trunk divides at this level. Then L left recurrent laryngeal nerve loops around the arch of aorta at this level. A the azygous vein drains into the superior vena cava at this level. N is about the nerves that the cardiac plexus of nerves are located at this level. And T is about the thoracic duct. The thoracic duct crosses from the right to left and reaches to the left at this level that is of the sternal angle and beside that we have the base of the heart upper limit and it is a uh, line which separates the superior mediastinum from inferior mediastinum so remember the red knot the rib the second rib arch of aorta tracheal division pulmonary trunk division left recurrent laryngeal nerve 
mesilaginous vein, cardiac plexus, and thoracic duct reaching the left side at this level. Beside that, the base of the heart is uh, related to this area and it is a plane which separates the superior mesilaginous from inferior mesilaginous. So, from this uh, revision, you know now the sternal angle is a landmark for locating jugular notch is at the upper level of manibus sternum. Zephyr process is the lowest part of the sternum. Coastal margins, it is on both the sides related to the coastal margin, but the sternal angle is basically related to the second coastal cartilage. Okay. Now, third question: interventricular septum of the heart is supplied by. So, to give the answer of this question, you must know the coronary circulation of the heart. So, let us revise our coronary circulation of the heart. So here something about the coronary circulation you know there are two coronary arteries the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. Now something about the courses of the coronary artery the right coronary artery arising from the root between the root of pulmonary tongue and the right auricle it descends anteriorly at the coronary circle that is arterioventicular groove. So it is descending and comes to the lower part of the heart that is at the junction of the right border of the heart and the inferior border of the heart and from there it turns back going to the posterior uh, atroventricular groove or posterior coronary sulcus and anastomosis with the left coronary artery and in posteriorly side it is basically giving the branching into the posterior atroventricular septum area also that the posterior descending part and the right marginal artery the main branch of the coronary artery. The left coronary artery after arising gives a branch known as left anterior descending branch which runs into the interventricular groove. Another branch left circumflex artery going behind and uh, moving into the posterior arterioventicular groove. So this is the basically the branch of the coronary artery. Now right coronary artery supplying the right atrium greater part of the right ventricle except an area adjoining the anterior interventricular groove. Then small portion of the left ventricle along the area of the interventricular groove, whole of the conducting system of the heart except the left branch of area and posterior part of interventricular septum is supplied by right coronary artery. Now the left coronary artery supplying the left artery mainly greater portion of the left ventricle anteriorly we see a smaller portion of left ventricle and posteriorly we have all of the left ventricle so greater portion of the left ventricle except the area adjoining the posterior interventricular groove because area adjoining the posterior interventricular groove is supplied by the right coronary artery and small area anteriorly adjoining the anterior interventricular groove anterior portion of interventricular septum and a branch of or left branch of the AV bundle. So we know this about the coronary arteries. Now let us find out the answer. So interventricular septum is supplied by right coronary artery? No. Left coronary artery? No. Because it is supplied by right coronary artery as well as the left coronary artery. So posterior part is supplied by the, we have the answer here, the posterior part is supplied by the right coronary artery and anterior part by the left coronary artery. So answer is anterior part by left coronary artery and posterior part by right coronary artery. So answer is fourth. Now hepatopancreatic duct opens into which part of the duodenum? Very simple question first, second, third or fourth. Let us see something about the anatomy of the hepatopancreatic duct. Here we have the anatomy, we have the liver, we have the pancreas, we have the duodenum, the first part of duodenum, second part of duodenum, third part of duodenum, fourth part of duodenum, we have the pancreatic duct, we have the coming up the common bile duct. So this common bile duct is joining the pancreatic duct forming a dilated area known as ampulla of water. This ampulla of water opening into the major duodenal papillae bounded by a sphincter known as sphincter of odi. So this is opening. You can very well see in the second part of duodenum that is 8 to 10 cm distal to the pylorus. This is known as duct of irsum. This is a pancreatic duct name. So this is the second part of the duodenum we had at the major duodenal papilla this hepatopancreatic duct is opening there is another small accessory pancreatic duct 
which is known as duct of centorni opening 6 to 8 cm distal to the pylorus 2 cm above the major duodenal papilla at the minor duodenal papilla. I also have a lecture on pancreatic physiology, the reference you can take from there. So the answer about this is simple, the second part of duodenum. Now one other question of anatomy is from that examination paper bone which is devoid of muscular attachment. Now you very well know these are the bones of the foot. So before moving to the answer let us know something about the bones of the foot. Now we have the bones of the foot. We have the seven bones in the foot known as tarsus and the mnemonic for this is simple the tiger cubs need MILC. So let us see what does that mean the tiger cubs need MILC. T for talus, C for calcaneum, N for navicular, M for medial cuneiform, I for intermediate cuneiform, L for lateral cuneiform and C for cuboid. Now this, these bones are arranged in form of rows. They have the proximal rows, so we have the proximal rows and we have the distal rows. In the proximal row we have the two bones that is talus and calcaneum, the talus above calcaneum below. In the distal row we have the four bones, the medial cuneiform which is hidden at this view, the intermediate cuneiform, the lateral cuneiform and the cuboid. We have the distal row and between the proximal row and distal row we have the navicular bone. So this is the seven bones of the foot and from the source book that is BD Jurassic Anatomy Volume 1, uh, sorry Volume 2 we have the answer the talus gives attachment to the ligaments but it doesn't give any attachment to the muscles it is devoid of all the muscular attachments the ligaments which are attached to the talus are capsular ligament of ankle joint talonavicular joint introsus talocalcaneum and cervical ligament talofibular ligament deltoid ligament talocalcaneum ligament so we have the answer is talus bone is devoid of the muscular attachment it gives only to the ligament attachments so thank you so much and have a nice day in my next video or in my next lecture we will be discussing some more questions from the same examination paper till then keep studying enjoy studying thank you so much